Right now, somewhere in the world, a database is getting breached. Millions of passwords, stolen in an instant. But if those passwords were stored correctly, the attackers walk away with nothing, just useless scrambled data they can't do anything with. But if they were not stored the right way, every single password cracked within hours, sometimes minutes. The difference between these two outcomes comes down to one concept, hashing. Let's start by clearing up the biggest misconception out there. Hashing and encryption are not the same thing. Encryption is reversible. You take a message, you lock it up, you send it somewhere, and the person on the other end unlocks it to read the original. The entire point is that you can get the original back. Hashing? Hashing is completely different. And a good way I can explain it is with a meat grinder. You take a steak, you feed it into the grinder, and out the other side comes ground beef. Simple enough, right? But what happens if you try to put that ground beef back through the grinder? You don't get a steak back, you just get more ground beef. And that's exactly how hashing works. It's a one-way function. Once the data goes through, there's no mathematical way to reverse it and get the original back. One more thing to point out. The output is always the same size. You could hash an entire novel, thousands and thousands of pages, and you get 64 characters. Hash a single word, also 64 characters. Completely different values, but always that same fixed length. So if you can't reverse it, why would anyone actually want this? What's the point of a one-way function? Well, it turns out this property is exactly what makes hashing perfect for storing passwords. When you create an account on a website, they should never, ever store your actual password. Instead, they run it through a hash function and store that output, just the hash, not the original. Then when you come back and try to log in, they hash whatever you typed and compare it to what they have stored. If the hashes match, you're in. If they don't match, access denied. They never need to know your actual password. They just need to verify that the hash matches. And this is why it matters for security. If attackers break in and steal the database, all they get are these hashes. And remember, meat grinder, there's no way to reverse them back into the original passwords. At least, that's how it's supposed to work. In practice, there are some serious problems. The first problem is that not all hash functions are created equal. Some are strong, well-designed, and have held up over decades of scrutiny. But others, others have been completely broken. MD5 was shown to be vulnerable back in 2004. By 2008, attackers were using those weaknesses to forge security certificates. And SHA-1 followed the same path, officially broken in 2017. If you're using either of these for anything security-related in your code right now, you need to stop, not eventually, today. But this is where it gets weird. Even SHA-256, which doesn't have any known weaknesses, is still the wrong choice for passwords. And the reason why I might surprise you, it's not about security flaws, it's about speed. General-purpose hash functions like SHA-256 are designed to be fast, really, really fast. And normally, that's a good thing. But for password storage, speed is actually your enemy. A modern graphics card, the same kind people use for gaming, can compute billions of hash operations per second. Billions. Which means an attacker who steals a database of hashed passwords can try billions of guesses every single second. Common passwords get cracked instantly. Dictionary words with some numbers added, maybe a few seconds. A name with a birth year, give it a minute or two. The speed of these hash functions makes brute forcing terrifyingly effective. But it actually gets worse than that. Enter rainbow tables. Attackers don't even need to compute hashes in real time. They can pre-compute the hashes of billions of common passwords ahead of time and store them in massive lookup tables. Then, when they steal your database, they just look up each hash and instantly find the matching password. No computation required, just a simple table lookup. This is how major breaches go from we stole some hashed passwords to everything's cracked in a matter of hours. So, we have two problems to solve. 
Fortunately, we have two solutions, and they work together beautifully. The first solution is called salting, and it's pretty straightforward. A salt is just a random string of characters that gets added to the password before you hash it. So instead of hashing just the password by itself, you hash the password combined with this random salt. And the crucial part, every single user gets their own unique salt. Let's see what happens. Two users both chose the same password, but because each one has a different salt, the resulting hashes look completely different. There's no way to tell these came from the same original password. And this completely destroys rainbow tables. An attacker would need a separate pre-computed table for every possible salt value. With a 16-byte random salt, that's more possible combinations than there are atoms in the observable universe. It's just not feasible. So salting solves the rainbow table problem, but we still have that speed issue. Attackers can still target one specific hash and throw billions of guesses at it per second. We need to slow things down. This is where bcrypt and argon2 come in. These are hash functions that were purpose-built specifically for passwords, and their most important feature? They're intentionally, deliberately slow. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Won't that make my application slow? And the answer is barely for legitimate users, but catastrophically slow for attackers. Think about it this way. A real user logs in once, maybe twice. An extra 300 milliseconds on each login, they'll never even notice. But an attacker trying to crack passwords needs to try billions or trillions of guesses. When each guess takes 300 milliseconds instead of a nanosecond, you've turned a few hours of cracking time into centuries. The math just doesn't work in their favor anymore. So let's talk about your options. First up is Bcrypt. This has been around since 1999 and it's battle tested. It handles salting automatically, so you don't need to manage that yourself. And it has this thing called a cost factor that you can increase over time as computers get faster so your security scales with hardware improvements. Then there's Argon2, which is the more modern choice. It won a password hashing competition back in 2015 and it's now considered the gold standard. What makes it special is that it's memory hard, meaning it requires a significant amount of RAM to compute. This makes it especially resistant to GPU-based attacks because GPUs have lots of processing power but limited memory per core. Either one is a solid choice. The important thing is that you use one of them. Don't try to roll your own solution with SHA-256 and manual salting. These libraries exist specifically because password hashing is tricky to get right, and they handle all the edge cases for you. Before we wrap up, let me quickly run through the mistakes I still see in production code. MD5 with no salt, broken algorithm, no salt, way too fast. Triple threat of bad. SHA-256 with no salt, better algorithm, but still no salt and still too fast. Encrypting passwords instead of hashing them, Wrong tool entirely. If you can decrypt it, so can an attacker who gets your key. And bcrypt or argon2, salted, slow, and secure. This is what you want. All right, quick recap. Hashing is not encryption. It's a one-way function like a meat grinder. You can't reverse it. MD5 and SHA-1 are broken. Don't use them for anything security-related. Speed is the enemy. Fast hashing helps attackers, not you. Salting defeats rainbow tables by making each hash unique. And Bcrypt or Argon2 are slow by design. That's the feature, not a bug. Look, proper password hashing comes down to one function call with the right library. That's it. There's no excuse for getting this wrong. Now, go check your code base, and don't forget to like and share if you found this helpful. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.